So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming out this morning. So, so pleased to have with us once again Ann Palmer, our dear, dear Ann Palmer. Ann's been a member of our collection advisory board since just about day one. And she is such an instrumental part of our museum. Ann also has done countless tread talks for us. You've probably heard her in her, one of her original tread talks on hood ornaments that she photographs. And then she did one just recently on Frank Lloyd Wright's automobiles. And uh, and uh, you may have seen her on TV not too long ago. She was on like KSNT or no, what? KTWU. KTWU, thank you. And did a wonderful uh, presentation on on that. And uh, she just was over at the Garage Car Museum in Slime a month or so ago doing a talk too. So she's a well, gets traveled around. So anyway, Ann is originally from Pittsburgh, Kansas. And she's been in Topeka since 1966. She said the tornado blew her in, so she came right after the tornado, so she missed that, fortunately. She's married. Her husband, Jerry, is over here. Jerry's a mediator in Topeka. They have two children and six grandchildren. Now, Ann's not one of these people that just sits back and does nothing. She's very well educated. She has two degrees from Lawrence. She has a BS that she received in 1964 in secondary education in history, and then she has her master's that she received in 1966 in rhetoric and public speaking and a public address, I should say. And then she decided to go back to college because she hadn't got enough. So in 1980, she came to Kansas State. She finally got the right college. <laughs> and came to Kansas State to get a degree in landscape architecture, which she got her master's in 1986, and she is still actively working in that career to this day. In addition to that, she's a professional photographer. She has a strong, strong passion for automobiles, as she's had since she was a child. And she loves to photograph cars and hood ornaments and just learn anything she can about cars. Anyway, we are so blessed to have Anne with us today, and she's going to tell us all about not only our 1937 Accord 812, but just Accord motor cars in general. So let's give Anne a warm welcome. Thank you, Doug. And however much Doug talks about them liking me, it is triple from me. When I was asked to be part of that group, it was because they were looking for somebody who was, can you hear me? Oh, it should be a little louder. Um, is, is that better? Okay. Um, they were looking for an expert in the 20s and 30s. They had sort of other areas covered. And because of my history in photographing vintage hood ornaments, I fell into that category. So I came to the first meeting. They hadn't quite opened yet. And so at the end of, of the first meeting, and there were like, four guys and me, and they kept thanking me for coming all the way from Topeka for this. And I said, look, we've been here an hour and a half, and all we have talked about solidly is cars. And no one has looked over anyone else's shoulder to find somebody else to talk to. <laughs> because that happens to me a lot, particularly with my husband, who, whose eyes glaze over in the first 20 seconds. <laughs> So this has been a gift. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy doing this. Um, the, the talk today is about the cord, but as you can tell from my slide there, the real story is the man and the automobile. This is a little different than other talks I've given. It's a very narrow, centered talk but the man is almost as, inter as interesting as the car, though hardly anything is as interesting as a cord. I first saw my first cord and my first 35 Auburn <coughs> boat tail speedster at the same time, which was one of the first really big um, museums, car museums we ever went to, which was in uh, Reno. And I had never heard of a cord, and I was fascinated by it, and I had never seen a boat tail anything. And I was interested in that, and you'll see photographs, because the two are tied together. Um, so I'm going to try to hold both the microphone and this. Um, this is Eret Loban Cord. And it's no wonder he goes by E-L. <laughs> I think those are E-R, 
E-T-T, E-R-R-E-T-T, -T, very unusual first name. This man was born in Warrensburg, Missouri in 1894. His family settled later in California when he was in his teens. His father died in 1911 and he took his first job as a used car salesman at 17 and I believe dropped out of school. By 1914, he was working in a service station by day, and at night, the owner would let him work on cars. So he would buy used Model Ts, and he would strip the bodies and put on um, lightweight, sleek bodies and modify the engine for a high-powered performance, and then he would race that car and then sell it as a race car and started his first idea of making money. Cord perceived, and this lasted him the rest of his life, that cars with eye-appealing style and powerful engines would eventually sell themselves. At the same time, 2,000 miles away in Auburn, Indiana, the Auburn Automobile Company had achieved a moderate amount of regional success as an automobile manufacturer. Auburns were essentially assembled cars using high quality components from several different sources. In 1919, the Auburn Company was sold to a group of investors from Chicago. The group included William Wrigley, the gum executive, uh, and they may have been skilled businessmen, but they were automobile neophytes. And by 1924, with the post-World War I recession, they were losing money. And in a field, because Auburn, Indiana, which I have been to, to the marvelous museum there, is rural. And so in this field behind the factory, they had 700 unsold cars. That's a lot. So an ambitious E.L. Cord at age 26, and this is probably about that age, had come to Chicago to go to work for the Moon Motor Car Company. I put this picture on because that's a 1920 Moon car. They were manufactured in St. Louis. They also manufactured, some of you know, the Diana. They were sort of twin cars. Well, this was the Moon. So he had gone there to work and the investors who were losing money in Auburn, or well, they were in Chicago, but their factory was in Auburn, um, somebody heard about this young phenom and so they bought a car from him and only to talk to him and talked him into going to work for Auburn in Auburn, Indiana and leaving Chicago. Um, let's see. Um, so they offered him a generous contract but he turned it down. He wanted less salary or 20% of the profits, whichever was greater, plus the option to buy all the common stock and total decision-making control. He could then be in a position to buy out the Chicago investors and the company would be his. The owners accepted his terms and he was hired as general manager. So he moved to Auburn the summer of 24 and things started to pop. The 700 cars were treated to new, bright, two-tone paint jobs. Prices were slashed. A national advertising campaign was launched. And encouraged by Cord's enthusiasm, dealers sold the cars to an eager public. The money he got for this allowed him to set in motion his dream of a transportation empire. And I think what you have to remember about Cord through all of this, he was not a car man. I think basically he had very little interest in 
the actual car, how it ran. Uh, oh, I guess he did because of souping up those cars. But he was a money maker, and he was a business maker, businessman. So in November of 1925, the 31-year-old Cord paid off the Chicago investors and assumed ownership of the company. He knew he couldn't be as big as the big three, so he looked for a niche. Well, he found a niche. He is quoted as saying, if you can't be the biggest, it pays to be different. Now, I was going to show you what the Auburns looked like when he took over the company in 1920. Uh, this is a 1920 Auburn. This is a 1922 Auburn. Um, you will notice that several of the black and white pictures are pictures from that era, and I have several. Um, if you see it in color, it's been taken later, but the black and whites are originals. Um, this was a 1923 Auburn and a 24 Auburn. Ah, now back. I show you these because they're very pleasant looking cars. I mean, nice. Um, nothing that sort of takes your breath away, um, but they're nice. By the time he took over in 1928, you had a 1928 boat tail speedster. So I think you can see the beginnings of change from the old Auburns to the new Auburns, which were his doing. Originality and motivation and innovation would play major roles in his success. He would become the driving force behind two of the most renowned classics, the Cord L29 and the Cord 810 and 812. I first ran into the Cord L29 at that museum in Auburn, and they had Frank Lloyd Wright's favorite automobile, and it was an L29. And I thought it was the oddest name for a car, until I finally, doing the research, figured out it's because it was released in 1929. Um, they made the L29s from 19, 20, 1929 through 1931. Um, in 1926, he was flush with Auburn's success. He eyed the Duesenberg and obtained the financially troubled company by an exchange of Auburn stock. He also got Fred Duesenberg, who would make a significant contribution to Cord's plan for a radically new automobile. In 1926, he also purchased the passenger car patent and the manufacturing rights to Harry Miller's front wheel drive design. That's big. That's something that he will revolutionize cars with. So, <clears throat> in November of 1927, the prototype of the new car was completed in California and Cord flew out um, to test drive it. It had a Lycoming straight eight engine and a modified Auburn sedan. Cord realized that this car had to have stunning good looks to match the advanced mechanical technology because he was making it with a front wheel drive. There had been a front wheel drive racing car developed by Harry Miller, but he bought those rights and Harry Miller and put the front wheel drive in a, in a regular passenger car. He hired a young man named Alan Leamy, who had been working with the Marmon. And those of you know the Marmon was a very expensive, very attractive car. But he hired Alan Leamy to design 
this new car they call the L29. And after that, Leamy went on to design the famous Duesenberg Model J. Uh, the decision was made to name the new car after its originator, E.L. Cord. You'll see that this Cord name becomes pretty typical from Mr. Cord being used for things. They made four <coughs> body styles, a sedan, a cabriolet, a phaeton, and a brome. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I'll, this was, I have a series of, um, this was the 1929 L29 Cabriolet Cord. And I have a whole series of the 29 and 30 and 31 L29s. They were gorgeous. They were dramatically different from any other car. And they were introduced to the public at a series of car shows in the spring of 1929. And they had lots of orders for them. And people were excited and industrialists and heads of state and a variety of people were interested. And then, of course, the crash in October. And as someone said, they simply lost their entire market. Um, but I'm going to go through so you can see. Again, these are not that much different from in time from the Auburns I showed you. But they are dramatically different. Um, and again, the black and whites in here are from ads of the time. And that one is literally in front of what is now the Cord Duesenberg Auburn Museum in Auburn, Indiana. Um, that's one of my favorites. And I love the part, the Cord Grand Prix winner model now on display here. I'm not sure they ever won the Grand Prix. <laughs> but, and Cord, which was given the highest award ever accorded an American automobile. By whom? I, you know, but it's, it's, it's Cord's marketing. Um, they were, in 1930, the official pace car of the Indianapolis 500. Um, which is, is pretty darn impressive. Um, how about that? How about that? I, you know, uh, and that's an old photograph. It's a, um, let's see, it's a 1931 L29 Speedster. Can you imagine how pretty it would have been with a modern photograph? <laughs> Um, and then the next thing is, you know, I, I've done enough work in the 20s and 30s now with cars and things. Prior to that, I just saw the 1930s as dark and desperate. You know, people's average annual income was around $1,000. There were bread lines. The Okies left, you know, and, and found terrible problems when they went to California. And that's all true, but boy, there was a lot of money also in, in the 30s. Um, here was the accessory for the Speedster. So apparently you could drink while driving. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Now, this, this is um, an L29. Uh, 1930. Can anybody tell me who these guys are? I'll tell you they're related. I heard it. The Marx Brothers. Yes, and I think that's Groucho in the in the passenger. In the well, and you know, I'm. Anyway, it's them. <laughs> It's them, um, and um, 
Okay, the cord was introduced, as I said, in June of 29. Prices ranged from 3,000 to 3,295. Um, again, people were, people, you know, after 29 were, were making maybe 1,000 or 1,500 a year, and that continued through most of, of the 30s. The competition, this was before the crash, they figured was Cadillac, Packard, and Chrysler Imperial. The people who wanted these cars were heads of state, actors, industrialists, and initial reaction was good and sales were brisk. But then, of course, as I told you, the, the crash sort of ruined that. Um, meanwhile, he still owns Auburn, and they're trying to make Auburn a little flashier uh, to be sold and, oh wait, one more. That was the Ze Zeppelin, and I always start to say Led Zeppelin, that was the band, <laughs> but that was the Zeppelin. Um, and what it says is the 1929 Cord L29 sedan with the Graf Zeppelin. In 1929, the Dur German dirigible toured the United States, and it said it and the cord were examples of the revolutionary 20s technology. So, now, here, it's not a very good picture, but you can see um, what, what the boat tail actually looked like. These are two pictures of the 1935 boat tail Auburn Speedster. Um, very good car, and they thought that maybe, you know, they would, it was head turning. Um, it, it um, you know, was, a, it was, they thought maybe a sports car for the masses, but the masses didn't have the money for the sports car. And so, in 1931, the Cord Company took over the Auburn Cord Duesenberg distributorship in LA. So it then controlled all of California. Cord's radio stations were atop the building, and Cord's salary was $795,000 a year. Yeah, in 1931. Uh, in 1932, he bought first 30 and then 40 percent of Avco, which was an aviation company, with stock in 25 different aviation companies. He was so financially successful, the automobiles were no longer priorities. But in 1933, he built Cordhaven. Now that was his mansion in Beverly Hills. His Cars are back in Indiana. He was from Warrensburg, Missouri, but he lives in Beverly Hills. And there are several interesting things about Cordhaven. It uh, had 32,000 square feet. Yeah, you heard me. 32,000 square feet, 16 bedrooms, and 22 bathrooms. Um, <laughs> I got so excited when I saw that and I thought, boy, you know, I wonder if I can see it. I wonder if they give tours. Well, in 61, it was torn down. It was on a huge acreage and they built a lot of fancy Beverly Hills homes. So it's gone. But there was another interesting thing. This was the architect. And I've got notes about him that I want to pull out. He is African American. His name is Paul Revere Williams. And he was the first African American in the American Institute of Architects. He built homes for business and entertainment legends like Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz, uh, Frank Sinatra, and as it says, entrepreneurs like the Cord and Paley families. I believe the Paley's are CBS. <laughs> and so um, I thought that was an interesting 
very interesting aside. Uh, okay. Now, just as he was building this, I don't know what the mansion cost. I, I never found that out, but it, it was sure big. Um, Auburn lost a million dollars in 1932, and sales decreased dramatically in 33 and 34. To stem the tide, executives thought about a baby Duesenberg, and they hired, these are executives at Auburn, <coughs> Auburn and Duesenberg, they um, hired away a man named, and many of you may know this name, and I may be mispronouncing it, Gor Gordon Burig, B-U-E-H-R-I-G. He was a designer from General Motors who designed the Duesenberg uh, J and was enticed to work on the new car for Mr. Court. Um, he created a timeless shape that would be hailed as one of the most beautiful auto bodies ever built. It too would be called Cord. It had three body styles, the sedan, the phaeton, the convertible coupe. Now, the, L20, the, the odd thing about Cord to me, particularly since it's so famous in in automobile history is that they really only made two cars. They made the L29 in 2930 and 31 and they made the 810, this gem that we have right here, in 36, but <coughs> times weren't any better <laughs> in 36. And so they supercharged and did a 37, but it's the same car. So really, Cord only built two models of cars, if, if you look at it that way. Um, they wanted to introduce it at the New York Auto Show in 1935. And this was important because the Auburn was facing extinction and they needed money. That's the Duesenberg that Gordon had designed. And that's such a cool car. Now, the Model J put, made the price of, of the Cord look like a bargain. Um, it, it was probably twice the cost of a Cord. Um, anyway, the um, 1936 Cord Model 810 with its styling and technical features was a colossal hit at the New York, Chicago, and LA auto shows. And this is what I love. The crowds were so desperate to see it that they would stand on the bumpers of the other cars in the show just to get a peek at this car. It was, it was essentially that hot. And again, these are pictures from, from the time. Um, and any of them you see will, in black and white, are. Orders poured in, and the cars were promised by Christmas of 35. The inside of this new 810, 812 was as attractive as the outside. Now, keep in mind that Cord, Mr. Cord, owned a bunch of aviation companies, including the one that became American Airlines. And so he was interested, and much of the interior of these 36 and 37 cords looked like the interiors of an, of an airplane. Um, I'm going to show you several of, of and all of these are either 35s or 36s. This one might be my favorite. Uh, not that I think it's the most beautiful, but I think it's the most unusual. It is, uh, and it's called an Armchair Beverly 810. 
I don't know where Beverly came from, but it appeared in several of, <coughs> of these cars. Now, how about that for an inside? White leather. I mean, there are few cars, I suppose that a Rolls Royce today might be that luxurious, but that is pretty darn luxurious. It, looks comfortable. it does look comfortable. You are exactly right. And it looks expensive. <laughs> um, then this was um, the 810 Westchester. And here we have Amelia Earhart standing beside her 1936 convertible Phaeton, um, which I think is, is great and good publicity. And again, a photograph from the era. All right, now we move in to the 812s. This is an 812. And they supercharged the 36s, rebadged them, changed them a little bit, and called them 812s. I love that one. Um, I think that's the one I have, maybe, uh, the little tin one on the thing that I ordered. Um, again, another supercharged one. <laughs> They, the colors, and again, we're, this is the middle of the Depression, 36. Think of the regular cars at this time. They were black, first of all, most of them, and boxy, and these were not. These really were gorgeous. And that one is simply called a special coupe. Now that's a modern picture, but of a redone car. Um, I love that one in the cornfield, <laughs> which was also a supercharged one. Um, and that one. These are just to show you, I could show you more and more. They're just gorgeous, you know? They're really, really pretty. This was called the Sportsman, for which I do not know other than the fact that it's just, again, beautiful, and anybody would like to drive it. Now, uh, I'm old, but I am not old enough for Tom Mix. <laughs> I knew his name, but I had to do some research. Um, he was, I always thought Rudolph Valentino was the biggest um, silent movie star. And I knew that he owned really expensive cars. But Tom Mix apparently might have made more money than him. And he was in three, over 300 Western movies. And he was the guy in the white hat. He was the image for the kids of that era for doing what was right. And literally, he was the cowboy with the white hat. Well. He loved the 812. And so he bought one and souped it up, as you can see, with flags after he, he didn't, once talkies came in, Tom Mix got out. Some people said it was because his voice was high and it didn't fit the image of the, you know, masculine cowboy. But they said another reason was he didn't care much for talking. And what he liked in the silent movies were the fight scenes and the, you know, cowboy, cowboying. Um, so he started what he called his circus, which was kind of like Buffalo Bill's traveling circus with cowboy shows and rope tricks and, and all of that. And he owned this beautiful, um, car and he was driving this 1937 car one morning as he left Tucson to drive north and had breakfast and I apparently as maybe was his custom had a couple of drinks with breakfast and missed the signs saying a bridge was out 
and which was really too bad, and wrecked his car in an arroyo because the bridge was out and was killed in 1940. But, but uh, so the car languished for a long time. Uh, but this, the man that bought it, <laughs> Bob White, loved Tom Mix and the car so much, he wrote a whole book, which you can see it's down here, all about the car, all about Tom Mix. Uh, really, really interesting, made you very sad uh, that as much as he loved the car, that it actually took his life. Very, very sad. Um, one of my favorite stories from doing this research was this Bob White is really serious about chords and about these particular chords. So he became friends, remember Gordon Burig, the designer. He helped Bob and became, they became friends. So one day in, I think it was the 80s, um, Bob was driving that redone beauty and took Gordon to lunch at a country club in Sun City, Arizona. So they get out of the car, a man parks next to them and goes in to the country club and doesn't turn his head even at the car. And Gordon said to Bob White, there goes a man with no soul. <laughs> I just thought that was a, and possibly true. Uh, this is, I think, one of my favorite car pictures, and you already have a picture of, of his car. But this is it restored and what it looks like today. And it was at night in a pretty setting. I think it's, I think it's just nice. Um, this was a picture of E.L. Cord, probably about the time when he was running all, all of the three companies. I better get back to my notes here. Um, now. Why did these cars not sell, even, even given the fact that they were sort of expensive and they did reduce the price? The problem with the 810s and 812s was they were rushed into production to try to meet the expectations. And they didn't get it right. The car had a lot of problems. And you know, all you need is a few cars to have problems, and then that car is labeled a problem car. And that's what happened to the 36 and 37s. And as they say, that they were things that could have been modified and have been modified in the people that collect them. But only 1,600 810s were built during the 36 model year, uh, but only 1,100 were sold. And they tried, because they couldn't keep up with the demand initially, to apologize. They sent all the customers who they couldn't get cars to statues on little marble bases of the car. Didn't help. <laughs> Didn't help. Still had problems with the car. So they took the leftover 810s that they rebadged them and sold them as, as 812s. The manufacturing cost of each cord then was higher because of the low volume of production. And in 37, because it was realized the cord was not going to sell in great numbers, they increased the prices to try to make a profit. In the 1937 model year, a supercharged engine and a long wheelbase custom series were introduced. The Lycoming V8 was equipped with the optional supercharger provided by the Schwitzer Cummins Company of Indianapolis. Horsepower jumped from 125 in the 36s to 170 in the 37s, and the top speeds of 100 miles an hour could be achieved. The last cord rolled off the assembly line in August of 1937, and cord 810 and 812s reached 3,000 units. In September of 1937, a man named A.B. Jennings set a stock world record 
of 107.6 at Bonneville Salt Flats, driving a stock 37 cord sedan, and that record lasted 12 years. So it's a remarkable car. I, as any of you have heard me speak before, I'm, I'm not even sure what I'm looking at when I look at the engine of a car. I'm not very good at that kind of stuff. But I'm really good at the design lines. And this was the most, I think, the most beautiful car ever made. Um, now, back to E.L., who's really rich by this time, but has, I think, lost complete interest in cars. And in an interview, apparently referred to the bankruptcy of all these cars um, as a, just simply a failed business deal. Um, he fled the United States and lived in England for a year because the SEC said that he had been trading certain stocks to manipulate the stock values. So he sold all his automobile stock for $2.6 million. The new owners shut it down and it became the Aviation Transportation Corporation. Auburn and Lycoming Engines filed for bankruptcy. Um, E.L. moved from Chicago to Beverly Hills where he added to his fortune with real estate, aircraft parts, household appliances, and a radio station. He had bought Stinson Aircraft back in 29 as another way to use his Lycoming Engines. He already owned American Airways, which became American Airlines. And several years after moving to California, Fortune named Cord one of the 50 richest men in America. Here he was in the mid-30s on the cover of Time magazine. And this was about the time he was coming out with the 810s and the 812s. Here I came across a fascinating photograph. And I couldn't figure it out then until I did a lot of research. But he, it, it says parents owned a grocery store. Um, you know, and then he built the cord building. He controlled over 150 companies and everything. Well, he owned a ranch in um, Nevada. So he left California, moved to Nevada, ran the ranch, and ran for Congress and served in Congress. And this was when Kennedy was campaigning in 1960. And so that, that is E.L. This the man had a fascinating life. I well, hand that to him. So, meanwhile, somebody bought up the rest of Cord's, what was left. And this is a fascinating thing. Preston Tucker, everybody knows about the Tucker, used the Cord transmissions in his Tucker cars. Many came straight out of the used Cords, cleaned up, painted, and installed. Now, how about that? I think that's really interesting. And here is a list of the Cord owners, just that you might know. Amelia Earhart, Tom Mix, Johnny Weismuller, the swimmer, Joan Blondell, the actor, Cecil B. DeMille, which was the biggest name in movies when I was a kid, Max Schmeling, Carmen Miranda, remember with the bananas on her head? Al Jolson, Sonia Henney, Barbara Stanwyck, and King Hussein of Jordan. So, you know, it was, it was quite, quite, a, quite a retinue of famous people. Now, um, in, I can't remember if I told you this earlier in the speech or I just told somebody, but it, it's worth telling you again. In 1951, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, made a list of the best designed things, the most beautifully designed things in the United States. And the, nine, the 812 cord was in that list. And, and I think that says a lot. Also, in, in, in 2009, a British sports car magazine called Class and Sports Cars, um, let's see, they asked 20 
of that year's top auto stylist to choose the most beautiful cars of all time. And the Cord 810-812 was number four on the list and the only pre-war pre car and the only American car. That's 2009, which seems like yesterday. You know, that's really a big deal. The thing about Cord is he started a foundation in the 60s. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, a lot of rich men start foundations. Then I read that last year, that foundation gave away $4 million. And I think they have to give 5% of, you know, a foundation each year. So maybe it's $90 million. Um, that's remarkable. And that Wichita State, uh, receives quite a bit of money for scholarships from the E.L. Cord Foundation. So again, kind of just, I, I can't decide after all of this how I feel about him exactly, um, but he, he did hire people that produced the most beautiful car ever, and he sure knew how to make money. Now, I'm saving the best for last, and I stumbled across this. And I don't know how many of you, a lot of you are my age, and I grew up a huge Batman fan. And this red car first appeared in Detective Comics number 48 in 1941, I think. Uh, and it was designed by a man named Bob Kane, and it was the original Batmobile, and it was modeled after the 1936 Cord 810-812. So, I don't know, of all the honors, this is my favorite. <laughs> Any questions? Have to, uh... This car has the uh, crash door that opens from the front. Was it amongst the uh, first two? You know, do you know? Because when you opened that, it was a surprise to me. Yeah, Alfred's had that also. Uh, the rear hand door. Um, there were some other car companies that did that, but uh, uh, call courts, at least the 36, 37, some of the Alfred's had the rear hinge doors. I do know that, that these cords had hidden hinges. That was one of, of the things that they said knowledge of history, would you care to speculate, had we not had the, the 29 crash, what would have gone on with these niche cars? Would they have just ballooned until maybe World War II, or what do you think would have happened? Boy, that's, that's interesting. You know, without, without, their, without the crash, would there have been a World War II? you know, in terms of Germany's complete collapse after the 20s. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I could speculate, you know, and that'd make a good class. You know, I think you could, you could study that for a period of weeks. Um, there's a, oh, I'm blanking on his name, but he's a professor at KU and he's a filmmaker, he just got an award with um, Kevin Spike, Wilmot. yeah, Kevin Wilmot. And I saw his film on if the South had won the Civil War. And it's that same kind of fascination. Um, I don't know. Thank you. What would have happened if Patsy Cline would have lived? <laughs> she would have done a lot more great records. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know, you wonder, on something like that, if she would have had the lasting fame, yeah. you know, and have triggered so many, I'm a Patsy Cline fan, yeah. you know, would have triggered so many women um, in, that, in that field. So, other questions? The tires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were the companies, you know, back in, the tire didn't last for a while. Right, right. 
Yeah. You know, do you know? I don't, I know about the lycalmine engine, I know about, but I don't know anything about the tires. Yeah, I don't know all the companies back then, but I know they have, you know, a lot of them have had tubes in the earlier ones. And that's why you'd see on some of these older 30s and 20s cars, they have dual mount spares, uh, because flat tires were so common. And they were easily accessible getting on the side, so. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know all the companies that were manufacturing tires, I think Firestone. Yeah, I know they were, they were that old. And I'm so delighted to have this young woman on the front row who is going to be a volunteer here. And I think, I think that's just great. My, my earliest memory of being fascinated by cars is when I was age six. So um, keep at it. Maybe you'll be a car designer. Yes, all right. Any other questions? Well, let's give in another warm round of applause. <laughs> we always enjoy when you do a presentation for us. It's fascinating, and she even always dresses the part. Look at this. Isn't that tremendous? I love it. Love it. I have to tell you, last night, um, my daughter, who lives down the street and across, um, down the block and across the street, was there, and and I said to, to she and Jerry, "Oh, um, I've got to I've got to get my costume out." And Andrew said, "Oh yeah, I really like that costume." And I said, "Andrea, that was my 20s costume. You can't wear a 20s costume for a 30s car." And she and Jerry just went. <laughs> We appreciate your attention to detail. <laughs> uh, this is a 812 Sportsman. Sportsman was kind of a nickname for the two-door coupe. A couple of things we got to point out about the car. You'll notice the, the wheel covers have the little holes all around them. That was kind of accidental because on the 36, the brakes would get hot. So they put the holes in them to help cool. But people loved it. So they carried it over to the 37 as well, kind of a styling cue. But the original thing was because the brakes would get warm. One of those problems with the 36. One well, of those problems with the 36. Other unique thing, and Ann touched on this, was with the transmission, the Bendix transmission. You'll look at this and you'll go, what in the world is that on the column? And the gear shift on it is a little tiny knob that you operate with your fingers. It's called the electric hand. When you come up, I want you to really look at that. It works very similar like your four-speed would on the floor. Bendix in 1935 came out with that for Hudson Motor Car Company. All the cars back in those days had this big, long gear shift lever on the floor. Well, the cars were big enough you could sit three people across, but it was very uncomfortable for the one in the middle to have that big shifter. They didn't have three on the tree manual transmission until 1939. Bendix came out with this to try to get the gear shift off the floor and onto the column. And it's electrical. It sends an electric signal to a solenoid and a vacuum motor, and it really shifts unique. You put it in first with your finger, but off on the clutch to get going. Once you're moving, you just flip it up to second without pushing the clutch in. When you want to shift, you let off on the gas pedal and re-push it back on, it will shift into second, or you pump the clutch once and it shifts again for you. And you can put it down to second or to third, same with the downshift. So the only time you really have to let the clutch out is when you go into reverse when you first start off. So it's kind of a unique situation. It was also very problematic and because of the electrical connections and the solenoids and all that. So Hudson, when they first came out, had so many problems with theirs. They actually stuck a gear shift lever up underneath the dashboard, and there was a plug on the floor. So if the Bendix electric hand failed, pull the plug out, screw the gear shift in, and you could bypass the system. <laughs> cord must have had those a little bit more refined because it didn't have that for cord. But like Ann said, Tucker didn't use it later in his 48 Tucker. And uh, so, in 1939, they came out with a three-speed manual transmission on the column, kind of killed this electric hand. But it's really unique, so when you see that, that's what that's all about. So, anyway, I invite you to come up, check the car out, we'll let you sit in it, we'll open the hood, we'll start it up. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ann, for a tremendous job. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you next month for the next one. <laughs>